Hey folks, since Ryzen launched in 2017, I've been using this, the Ryzen 7 1700 as my main system CPU of choice, and it was quite the upgrade. At the time, I was using an Intel Core i5-4590 for, well, everything, gaming, content creation, benchmarking, the lot. And going from 4 cores and 4 threads, to 8 cores and 16 threads, was, well, quite simply, revelatory. The Ryzen 7 1700 came with a base clock of 3.2GHz and a maximum single core turbo of 37 which matched my 4590 in terms of max turbo speed. The 1700, unlike the Intel CPU, wasn't locked though, and my Ryzen 7 has had all 8 of its cores locked to at least 3.7GHz since day 1. My particular 1700 is actually happy running at 4GHz and it remains surprisingly cool when using an AIO, but the real sweet spot for max performance, while well, taking into consideration power draw, is somewhere around 3850MHz on all 8 cores. So why this trip down memory lane? I mean everybody at this point knows the value that a Ryzen 7 1700 offers even today. Well there is actually a reason for it. AMD has kindly sent over a Ryzen 7 2700X, a CPU which, to be perfectly honest with you, I skipped in its entirety during its launch simply because I was happy with my 1700. I mean, it was offering my 1800X like performance when overclocked, and I stuck to my guns and told myself that there would be absolutely no difference and no need to jump to the 2700X. So today we're going to be testing that theory and putting the 2700X up in stock form against my own daily driver system, and coupling it to both a Radeon RX 590 and my RX Vega 64 to see if there's actually any gains to be had between 1st and 2nd gen Ryzen, when using a mid-tier and higher tier graphics card, and specifically comparing a stock 2nd gen to the overclocked 1st gen. At this point, I guess we should go over the specs of the Ryzen 7 2700X. It features the same 8 core 16 thread configuration as my 1700, but it comes with a base clock of 3.7GHz out of the box, and it can boost up to around 4.25ish GHz on its strongest single thread. We get the same amount of cache on the CPU, which is 16MB of L3, as well as half a megabyte L2 cache per core, giving a total of 20MB. During these tests, and since my system has its memory, the 16GB of Corsair Vengeance DDR4, clocking in at 3000MHz, we're going to be using the same settings when testing the 2700X. One thing to note, and something that might give the 1700 a bit of a boost, is that my system is based around an ASRock X370 Killer SLI motherboard, a Gen 1 chipset, and while it is running the latest P5.1 BIOS, it will mean that the 2700X can't use PBO or Precision Boost Overdrive. This will mean that the boost frequency is a little bit lower than if we had the CPU running on an X470 motherboard. But this is actually a realistic setup for any of us who jumped onto the bandwagon with Ryzen 1st Gen and were possibly thinking about an upgrade. So let's kick things off with the new Cinebench R20, which is the latest release of the CPU taxon test. Now this is a pure CPU test, with the GPU not really factoring into the result. My 3.85GHz 1700 first, and what's nice to see is that it scores around 10% higher than what Cinebench is suggesting a stock Ryzen 7 1700X should be achieving, highlighting how much of a smart decision buying a 1700 and overclocking it was during the first gen. The Ryzen 7 2700X though manages to impress even more, with all of its cores settling in at over 4GHz when XFR is left to do its thing, and it managed to net a score above 4000 points. For reference, Cinebench also includes a few other examples pre-populated, and when comparing any 8-core Ryzen to the old i7-7700K, which was Intel's best offering at the time, you can see exactly why Ryzen stirred up the market so much on its release. CPU-Z now, yup, the same CPU info tool I'm sure many of you use, but what you might not know is it's a great way to put 100% load on your CPU, using the built-in benchmark and stress features. Like Cinebench, CPU-Z runs through a preset benchmark and provides a numerical score, which is quite good if you want to quickly see how your CPU performs before and after overclocking. Like Cinebench, it also allows you to compare the stock scores of other CPUs. So here I've included the Ryzen 7 1700X, the 1800X and also the Core i7 8700K as reference. 
Running the 17.01.64 benchmark, we can see that my overclock 1700 returns a result ahead of the 1700X and 1800X in both single and multi-threaded tasks, and returns a score of 445 and 4780 respectively. The Ryzen 7 2700X trumps that with a nice boost in single threaded performance up to 482 and manages to hit 5000 points on the multi threaded benchmark. Compared to the 8700K, any of the 8 core Ryzen 7s will return better scores on multi threaded, but the single threaded performance of that 6 core Intel chip is still a bit ahead, although it's nice to see how much second generation Ryzen improved over the first gen in this test. Moving on to a synthetic workload with TimeSpy and taking an average of multiple runs, with an RX 590 clocked at a completely locked 1560MHz on the core and 2.1GHz on the memory, while the Vega had its clock speed hovering at just over 1600MHz, using my custom undervolt profile, while the HBM2 was at a static 945MHz. When looking at the CPU score, the 2700X, as expected, runs a higher score than my overclocked 1700, there's no doubts about it, but what is interesting though and also repeatable is that when we look at the graphics score result, the 27X system also consistently nudges out the same GPU when it was coupled to the 1700. A bit of a surprise in what should be a completely GPU bound score, but hey, I'll take the win. Now when it comes to gaming, I've never really felt like the 1700 underperformed, and when going through Shadow of the Tomb Raider on my custom graphics preset, this certainly proved to be the case, at least while using the RX 590, with there being only a 1 FPS difference separating the systems. Now Vega 64 was a slightly different story, with the system performing around 3% better in terms of average frame rates when coupled to the 2700X. Something that was confirmed when I run through the canned benchmark and recorded the total amount of frames rendered during that time. The difference was pretty negligible when using the RX 590, but the gap widened considerably when using the more powerful Vega 64 card. Finally, I tested out Far Cry 5 as it's a game that can use more threads, but it still loves at least one or two really strong threads, and the result here shows an area where the 2700X, even in its stock form, will outperform an overclocked first gen Ryzen by a considerable degree. When using the RX 590, a mid tier card, we've seen averages jump up by around 2 FPS, while the minimum's also seen an increase, but it was again when using the Vega 64 card that we've really seen a difference. Average FPS increased from 89 to 98, and the minimums also jumped up by almost 10%. This was also replicated by using the built-in benchmark and comparing the total frames rendered for each configuration. A great result for the 2700X and Vega 64, but more importantly, one that was repeatable time and time again, and a test that really does highlight the potential benefits of the tweaked Ryzen 7 second generation CPU. So we've got a load of data points here, so let's try and break it down a little. Going back to the CPU tests first off, in all scenarios the 2700X returned a score at least 5% more than my heavily overclocked 1700, with a considerable better single threaded performance in the CPU benchmark, and this of course was while drawn a considerable amount less power. It's a similar story with TimeSpy, with even the GPU scores taking a jump by a couple of percent when using the 2700X over the 1700. And again, like in the CPU Z benchmark we saw, the CPU scores were increased by between 7 and 8%, depending on the class of GPU used. But it's when gaming that the real benefit of the 2700X is seen. First off, with a mid tier GPU like the RX 590, in games like Shadow of the Tomb Raider, which already kind of work really well with the Ryzen architecture and don't discriminate too much when it comes to high single threaded performance, the difference was fairly small. Still, we could quantify it to be around 2% faster when using the 2700X, but it's when looking at Far Cry 5, which loves a single strong thread, while still being nicely multi-threaded to an extent, that we see by using the 2700X, we were able to render 6% more frames during the same time when using the RX 590 than when we were using the overclocked 1700, and this is only amplified when we jump up a tier to the Vega 64. In Shadow of the Tomb Raider we've seen a 6% difference in total frames rendered, and a whopping 14% increase in total frames rendered during the exact same time when running the Far Cry 5 benchmark. Remember these test scenes are controlled for time, 
and they're highly repeatable. And I guess this is the market that the Ryzen 7 2700X is gunning for. Those who need really good single threaded performance, as well as a high core count CPU, which just simply isn't available at the same price from Team Blue. Now, seeing my own Vega 64 work better and more freely was great, as I do still play a few games that love a strong thread, and the extra 500MHz on offer with the 2700X and XFR obviously plays very nicely when that's the case. Now, of course, we haven't even touched on tweaking and tuning the 2700X, as there is still a little bit of headroom which we can look at in another video. But when it comes to the stock clocked Ryzen 7 2700X versus my own overclocked 1700, well, I started this video by saying that I skipped to the second generation entirely, but now seeing the performance that's on offer when paired to a higher tier graphics card, it is objectively better than the first gen. And if I was building a new system now and coupling it with something like a Vega 56 or RTX 2060 level of card, I would most certainly pony up and buy a CPU from the second generation of Ryzen, rather than save a few quid and go for a used Ryzen first gen. Now that's absolutely not to say that the 1700 has no merit now. Without a shadow of a doubt, it's probably the best and cheapest way to get 8 cores on a future ready platform today at a knockdown price. And if your application or package, say some card or rendering packages, can use 16 threads and don't really care too much about peak clock speeds, then it's a no brainer option. Save some money, overclock the 1700 and you're laughing all the way to the bank on that multi-core bliss train. But for gaming especially, the 2700X, it really is a notch above even an overclocked first gen Ryzen 7. And being able to get more out of the other components in your system, well that's got to be worth something too. Whether or not it still looks as impressive in a couple of months time when Zen 2 and the Ryzen 3000 desktop CPUs have launched, well we'll just have to wait and see. But now I just need to hope that AMD forgets they sent this over so I can keep enjoying the extra performance I'm getting from my Vega 64. But hey, I'd love to know what you'd do at this point in 2019. Save some cash and go for first gen, take the extra performance and offer from the second, and also if any of you have actually upgraded from first gen Ryzen and which processors you upgraded from and to. For now though, I'll just say take care, and I'll see you all in the comments section down below, and in the next video.